point of making these women as mediocre and messy as possible is to show that the deepest well can also be drained. And that's one of my favorite Swedish phrases. In Swedish, it's then du pastet brunnen kan också Thomas. So the deepest well can also be drained. And black women are some of the deepest wells in society. So what I wanted to show with their stories is once they start losing strengths and that <laughs> bottomless, quote unquote, source of resilience, then at the bottom of it all, they are just human beings like you and me that need support emotionally, mentally, physically, holistically. Welcome to Flourish in the Foreign, the award-winning podcast that celebrates, elevates, and affirms the voices and stories of Black women living and thriving abroad, while exploring living abroad as a pathway to wellness. I'm your host, Christine Job, a Black American woman with Trinidadian roots, a business strategist and consultant from Atlanta, living and thriving in Valencia, Spain. Hey everyone, welcome to Flourish in the Foreign. I am Christine, the host of this here podcast. Hey, it's been a minute. It has been a minute and I apologize. I went on an unexpected hiatus due to being ill, quite frankly, for the past month off and on and being busy with some speaking and other things I have going on. Y'all know this is a solo indie podcast, so when your girl is down, so is the podcast. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. But back to our regularly scheduled program. A big welcome to all of the new listeners of the podcast. Hello. I'm so happy to have you here. If you have found the podcast organically or through a friend's suggestion, or if you heard about the podcast through the chat that I had with Cinnamon on her YouTube channel with Candice, Hooray. I was a guest on Cinnamon, aka Driven Spice YouTube channel, talking about living abroad, why I left the US. And it was just a great conversation. And it has gotten a lot of views and a lot of comments. And I appreciate that. Shout out to both Cinnamon and Candace. I always love chatting with them. And both of them are past podcast guests of this here podcast. So if you haven't checked out their individual episodes, scroll back and uh, listen to those. Cinnamon's is in season one and Candace's episode is in season two. Be sure to check me out November 29th where I'll be speaking at the Power to Fly UK Europe Diversity Summit. I'm so excited about it. The title of my talk is Embracing Soft Life Principles for Career Sustainability and longevity. So I'm super excited about that. I'll put the link to that event in the description of this episode. I was also a judge for the International Women Podcast Awards earlier this month. So your girl has a lot of stuff going on, you know, just like y'all. I'm just like, I got a lot of stuff going on too. But thank you so much for your patience and your well wishes. And those of you that checked in on me, that's so nice of you. I appreciate y'all so much. Please remember that the Flourish in the Foreign Patreon will be coming to an end at the end of 2023. So please be sure to become a monthly supporter at Buy Me a Coffee. That's buymeacoffee.com slash Flourish Foreign, where you'll find benefits like the Flourish in the Foreign book club, author chats, monthly chats with me, invitations to recording sessions, and much more. A friendly reminder to everyone, I will be doing another Ask Me Anything episode at the end of this season, so be sure to please submit your questions via the link in the description of this episode. All right. On to the episode. Season 5, 
Episode 5. Today's episode is an author chat with Lola Akamade Ackerstrom of In Every Mirror She's Black and her latest fiction book, Everything Is Not Enough. This episode is full of spoilers. I repeat, This episode is full of spoilers, so listen to it at your own risk. Be sure to order Everything Is Not Enough right now. It is so good. Oh my goodness. Now, if Lola's name sounds familiar, it's probably because Lola is a celebrated Nigerian photographer and travel writer based in Stockholm, Sweden. She's the editor-in-chief for Slow Travel Stockholm. Her works have been featured in the National Geographic Traveler, BBC, and CNN, among other publications. She's the author of the travel books Due North, and the best-selling Langholm, The Swedish Secret to Living Well. But perhaps you know of Lola because of her wonderful episode here on this podcast, Season 1, Episode 50, where she shares her journey of moving from Nigeria to the U.S. for school and then to Sweden for love. In that episode, she also shares how she made an epic career transition into photojournalism. I also had the pleasure to record an author chat with Lola about her debut fiction novel, In Every Mirror She's Black. And today I am so thrilled to have Lola back to discuss the sequel, Everything Is Not Enough, so you should order it and buy it now. This discussion will have some spoilers. This book is so good, as you will soon hear from my conversation with Lola. I had to put the book down a couple times because I was I was in my feelings. I, I was feeling a lot of feelings. The characters really took me there at times. But I will let Lola tell you all about it. Thank you so much, Christine. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. So thank you. And it's been incredible. I mean, since last time we spoke, right, the book has really taken the world by storm in many ways. And now I'm super honored and grateful that the follow-up is out this October. For those of you that may not know, In Every Mirror She's Black It is a book that revolves around three Black women from different cultural backgrounds and walks of life who find themselves navigating the challenges and complexities of life in contemporary Sweden, and their paths all cross due to one white Swedish man. <laughs> We have Kemi, who is an ambitious Nigerian woman who is the professional go-getter and is really navigating the Swedish corporate landscape. We have Brittany Ray, an African-American woman from Atlanta who moves to Sweden for love and grapples with that choice, we could say, and her loss of identity. And we do have Muna, who is a teenager when we meet her, who is a refugee, who has to confront not only racism, but also struggling to find her place in a society that definitely marginalizes her. Okay. And so that is our quick up to speed. I have been stressed out. Let me just be completely honest. I'm not a cool cucumber. I'm not Terry Gross. This is a fresh day. I've been so stressed out to chat with you because I think you already know this. I love the first book in Every Mirror She's Black. This book put me through it. I threw this book so many times. Um, I just collapsed on my sofa. I was yelling. I was talking to my girlfriends about it. They're like, do you like it? I was like, no, I love this book. She's like, what's with the angst? I was like, these characters are driving me crazy. They're driving me nuts. So I suppose (laughs) the place where I want to start is your decision to start the second book in the midst of the mess. Because you could have fast forward. You you left us on three cliffhangers. We were all like, what's the next book coming? What's going on? And you picked up, which is very gracious yeah. of you, to continue those scenes. Um, and they're messy. And it's emotionally heavy start to a book. There is no like, yeah. 
once upon a time or now we're on spring or whatever. It is in the mess. You're merely covered with it. How do you decide yeah. to, to pick up like that? So when you think about a cliff, even when you're watching a movie, when you're diving off a cliff and they say coming, you know, finishing episode two, the first book ended with all of them diving off the cliff, right? What happens when you dive off a cliff? You need to land before you either survive or get up and move. And so that's what the second book do- does is let them, boom, land with a thud because they just all jumped off a cliff and then get up, you know, and walk. Metaphorically, it's like a short cliff, right? Just dive off and still, still have your limbs, you can walk, right? So that was the point is for me to write the second book, it, would have, it wouldn't have made sense to start a different way. I needed them to just land from where they were falling and then get up different ways and see how they want to then move forward from these decisions in their lives. So, so that's kind of why I started it this way. I, I think your decision to have Muna try to commit suicide and be in a medically induced coma for a large portion of the book. At first, I was devastated because she was my favorite character. She was the one that had the least amount of support. I was so heartbroken to have that scene play out. But then as I'm going through the book and we're getting into Yasmin's story and all the other women's story, I realized that Moon is the only one that's resting and healing. And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> must we be in a coma to rest and heal? <laughs> No, 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 no. And and you know what? That's why I'm writing this is so that we can take away all the shame or, or show that we need support or show that we are not always strong so we can get the same support that white women get with ease that allows them to thrive, you know, with ease. And so that's why, so that's my mission. That's my mission. It's not to keep putting these women in trauma upon trauma is to show that this is what society inadvertently does to us and then asks, why aren't you driving? I'm like, because your leg is on my back. I can't get up. And so once, you know, and I always say the thing is is when people always say, oh, you're doing great, walk harder. But then they're the ones that can actually lift the load off your back. uh, That is no kind of support I want, you know. If you say walk harder, but you are the one that can actually just take the load off, (laughs) <laughs> so it can be easier to walk harder, you know. And so that's why I'm writing all of this and making these women so real so that it not only triggers, but it also triggers that shadow side of us that we're not working on. Because I always say this, and I don't know if I said this in the first interview, life for a Black woman is like walking into a circus, like where they have this room of horrors and they have these mirrors that kind of distort you, your image. So you go to the mirror and then it's like your arms are short or it stretches your torso. And then you look into that mirror as a black woman and you say, that's not me. So what do I do? I try to overcompensate by trying to stretch my hand to see if I get all the degrees. I am work four times as hard. I am excellent, right? But I can't break that mirror. The owner of the circus needs to break that mirror. So that mirror is the stereotypes that society creates that's not us. And so we overcompensate. I think that was very beautifully put here the kind of hall of mirrors. Because I think that is exactly what it is. And it does seem like the one who can torch themselves the best with a smile on their face wins, whatever it is, because you still have to be contorted yeah. in all these things. Exactly. I think what Muna's story also drew home is her lack of support, but then the support that she received, I won't say when it was too late, but... Uh, you know, when someone attempts to kill themselves, it feels a little bit too late for some people to be stepping up. But then we do yeah. see Yasmin step up in that support role. And so I I kind of want to discuss now the role of family and support in this book. On one hand, being the anchor for these women and their identity in this hall of mirrors but also on one hand, being a force of constraint in a lot of ways, whether it be 
with like in Kehinde and uh, Kemi being uh, their morals yeah. <laughs> and their judgment and things like that. Yeah. I think I actually want to bring up something in that first chapter was so well done. You had so many, I, I mean, I highlighted the book so many times, but you had so many passages that I was like, oh my goodness. Um, so I think a good way to kind of segue into the support that Yasmin didn't have and then what she found in Yagis, um, especially exemplified in this book, is in that first chapter, I think it's the first page, uh, in reference to Yasmin's time in Rome with the police. Um, yeah. And she's working as a prostitute at the time. And she's been she's been called in uh, for questioning. And you write in reference to the police officer, when he finally took what he wanted from her in a back room of the station in exchange for the freedom she already had, her fear had already taken, uh, her fear had already been taken, or her fear had already taken her choice, there we go, and reason with it. And yeah. I think this is one, what a way to say that. <laughs> Especially about the freedom that she already yes. had. Yes, she was scared, and that's what shows where what fear can do. Because when you come from places that fear authority figures, then you don't question anything. She could have just said, "No, I don't have to say anything. I'm not talking without a lawyer. I don't have to. I don't believe anything." But she gave because she thought that was what would make her go scot free. And so she finds support. In this aid worker to an extent he gets her to sweden and i and, and i really wanted to write that into this book about uh because it's it's prominent in europe it, it really is it's the um uh the white saviorism i'll take care of you i will get you better but it's but it's all sex trafficking so. uh, she gets put into the apartment with muna in the first book she meets yagis they fall in love i'm not sure if fall in love, but I think they like each other. And this is a sense of stability, security, protection, and support. Yeah. And so we see how their relationship is evolving in this book. And what I find so interesting is that even with the dynamic between her and Yagis, that is a sense of support and stability. But also the sense of support and stability that she gets from her relationship with Salima and her her sister Amani. And I just thought that is kind of part of this not only character evolution, but is true to women who live abroad that perhaps you're not in the same situation, but it does become this cultivation of sorts of trying to find and cultivate that trust. Yeah. And I'm just wondering what led you to, to showcase Yasmin as you did in this book. Well, one uh, Yasmin, I she she was one of my favorite characters from the first book, but more so Yahis, her husband. I actually is actually one of my as an author to write one of my favorite characters from the first book, and I did and I wanted to find a way to bring him as well into the second book. And I said, of course, it has to come through Yasmin because our story is what's going to keep him there. Because that character is such a great, complex character that represents a lot of immigrants turned residents in Europe, where on the one hand, they're working really hard. But on the other hand, there is a lot of resentment and because maybe they came from a better place. And I get that a lot when I'm taking taxis and I'm talking to taxi drivers where one was like a, was a violin player and his country and his driving taxi. Like, I feel that. So I want to do that in that character. But with Yasmin, I wanted to show that there are so many women in Europe that have that past. Many of them in Southern Europe or maybe in like the Netherlands. Or, and I wanted to show that you can still rise from that because sometimes you do things out of your control, you know, but that that you shouldn't always carry that thing. You should give yourself grace. This book is about grace. So she, 
this book is about Yasmin giving herself grace to evolve, to be better. So I wanted to show um, just a character that was on the lower economic ranks that, that where you'll see more uh, maybe refugees in there, like working blue collar, showing the day to day to show how hard working, doing our work, also showing the tensions between communities, like between like Middle Eastern communities and African communities. There's all of that there, but we're still friends, but still, but still kind of have access to be rude to each other. I don't know, <laughs> but that's what I wanted to show with Salima and Amani and Yasmin, that dynamic, because that dynamic is true, um, where there is still just community tensions on that level as well. And then I also wanted to tap a little bit into like the gang um, kind of uh, narratives and stuff going on, you know, where this is what causes people sometimes to do things. It doesn't absolve anybody. I'm not absolving Yagis, but I think by showing what his motivations are, then you can begin to understand why people do some things they do because they don't feel respected or seen or acknowledged in society. To continue our conversation about family and support, let's talk about Kemi, who has family and that kind of support, right? She's a professional. She has a lot of agency. And yet her twin helps to anchor her in this life, the life that she had in the States, in her morals, in her her ideals, because her twin is married and has children, is living that life. If there is, I don't even know, tension, but also, I guess, that pressure for her to conform in a certain manner, morally. I would also say that Kemi has somewhat of the support Found into Tobias's mother because she approves. And she is this, you know, beautiful Gambian woman who's like, this is this is what he needs, a black woman. He doesn't need to date no more white chicks. Exactly. Exactly. Kimmy is is several rungs above uh Muna and Yasmin socioeconomically. And yet yeah. I feel like she's the most angst-filled character. In the entire book. Yeah. And I'm just wondering why? <laughs> because it's that mirror. She's the one that's contorting the most to appear. And the more you conduct, the more pain you're in, right? The more angst you feel because those are unnatural positions to put yourself. And with the family, maybe Kemi just doesn't want a family. Maybe she just doesn't want that. But she has never really truly interrogated that. She's she just says, this is what she needs to do. This is what she needs. What if Kemi just is meant to be a sugar mommy and just living her life? I don't know. But she's never gone to therapy to figure out what it is she wants. But because of this is what her twin has, this is what society says she should have, this is what our culture says she should have, she's fighting all of that. And when she finds Tobia, who could potentially just be who she may just want, whereas we're not married, we're just partners, I don't know, like a Oprah Stedman situation. I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, she was fighting that because she's like, I don't think this is what everybody says I should have. And so I guess I need to settle another and quote unquote equally your partner. Well, who is that? It has to be somebody on my level. Well, I am in a place that's not as diverse where people at my level aren't going to be mostly black. So I'm not going to find, unless I move to the UK, maybe Germany, or definitely when I move back to the US, will I find a black man as a director or CEO at my level? So that already minimizes our pull. And then the issue with Ragnar was just a power struggle, just a power struggle, because he came in and took over our project, probably with mediocre credentials. <laughs> and she was fighting to say, you know what, I'm so much better than you. I'm so much smarter than you. And then they start that because, and I write it in the book. And if people read and, and pull that nuance, whenever she's angry, he's calm and looking at her lustfully. When, whenever it's heated, she's calm and look like there's some, it's, and I said that they are seesawing emotions. So it's that power, confidence thing that's attracting those two characters. Let's continue on to Brittany, Brittany Ray, which I think last time we chatted, 
I was telling you, so I'm from Atlanta. I was like, this chick, no. But this book, by the end, I was like, all right. And I knew I have to work on me. I, this is a me issue. Now, Brittany <laughs> is rungs above um, uh, Kemi because old. she's married to old Swedish money um, and has a baby. So locked in. And yet she has perhaps uh, the type of support. It, I mean, it could be maybe comparable to Yasmin. However... It's a little bit different, right? Brittany has support from a best friend in the States and family that loves her. Yeah. But she's not honest with them, I yeah. think, in real time. It feels very lag. She's ashamed. She's ashamed. Because it's because like you said, she's a lady from Atlanta who has to she has to put up the facade that you know, I'm living life, I'm bougie, I'm enjoying my life here in Sweden. So she can't tell them fully because she's ashamed. It, I think that is what probably broke my heart enough to allow the warmth for Brittany to come up. Because I realized, especially the scene where she's having a lunch or brunch with Kemi and she's trying to ask her for a divorce attorney, but she's being like, I don't want to talk yeah. about it. Girl, you don't have no friends. You don't want to talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. It's keeping up that facade. I'm like, I'm good. I'm fine. You know, life, I've, this is what I've always wanted, you know, to be kept and flown and flewed out you know like she that was what she was keeping up uh that uh, facade but then realizing i'll say one of my favorite scenes i have lots of little favorite scenes but when she and kemi meet at the american club event and they're kind of going back and forth and she's like ha, 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 and then kemi's like and they're fighting and then she says you know what i get it you're lonely too and she's like what do you mean she's like yeah you don't even like me and yet you're tell, telling me all your business I get it. It's lonely. You don't have any friends. And she gives Kemi a glimpse into her own loneliness, you know, and that's how they became kind of friends, you know, throughout the book. So I was I wanted to show that sometimes people that you will not be friends with, normally in a place where you can just fully break, circumstances can push you together. And that's the same thing with Yasmin and Salima and Aman. It's like your circumstances push you together. So you can realize that, you know what, we're still human. I still need to feel human. I still need to feel seen and, and listen to acknowledge, even though I don't like you. At least you still see that I'm breathing. It's the same way Muna kept going to Yai in the first book. She not, he didn't like her. You know, she was, each time she comes, it's like, oh, God, this week is back. and Leave me alone. But if you think about it, he was the only constant in her life. She knew. That if I went to this place on a Thursday at this time, yeah, it will be there. So he rooted that in that sense that at least he didn't go away. At least she's alive. She's not living in a dream. There's one person I see that hasn't left, right? This is what a lot of women that live abroad face when they move into new different expat communities or immigrant communities is, you know what? If I was living in Atlanta, maybe we won't be running in the same circles, won't be friends, whatever. But here, we don't have much. We can only lean on each other's support based on our similarities. Even though we may have more differences, we need to connect and just stick to each other on those few similarities we have so we can <laughs> try and thrive in some way. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Flourish in the Foreign. And if you have, please support this labor of love because it is labor nonetheless. You can support this solo indie podcast by becoming a member of the Flourish in the Foreign Buy Me a Coffee membership, where you can subscribe to support the podcast on a monthly basis. You can also give one-time support via Buy Me a Coffee as well. And you can do either one at buymeacoffee.com slash flourish foreign. Support this podcast by writing a review on whichever platform you listen to the podcast. And if you listen on Spotify, you can also leave comments on each episode. 
and even answer some of the poll questions I've created for certain episodes. Be sure to share this podcast with your friends and family and even the colleagues you kind of like. This podcast continues to exist and thrive due to listeners like you. Thank you so much for your continued support. Now, back to the episode. To your point, there when you are abroad, and I always tell people, you know, language and nationality are not what make you friends. However, when you don't have any friends, you're gonna need to go to that American society. You're gonna need to find someone that can yeah. see the humanity in you. Listen the beginning. I listen the beginning, you know, so that because it's easy to to forget, it's easy to get depressed, it's easy to feel like you're isolated but and that's why like a lot of immigrants when they move they're like i don't want to join any expat communities i don't want to be like isolated because then i won't integrate we get that yes you you don't have to but after a while you're gonna once in a while want to look at somebody that maybe came from where you came from that maybe understands as well maybe has been here longer than than you you know i i remember there was somebody i think it was a reader that was that read the first book and was like, oh, I don't, I think it was a black woman as well. I don't recognize any of this. It's, no, I don't, you know. And, and they were asking, so how long have you lived in Sweden? It's like three years. <laughs> and I said, that's great. You know, everybody has their own experience. I've lived there close to 14 years. It doesn't negate your experience. It means making space and maybe in five years, you, you're going to start seeing some things as well, right? So so I think the reason I'm writing this book is to give people a lot more information to know that you should come, yes, come, bright-eyed, willing, and ready to integrate, but also understand that some things are not always on the immigrants or the expats to integrate, that it actually could be society, could be cultural things that may prevent or make it even 10 times as hard for you uh, to integrate, even if you know the language, even if you are fluent in the language, it's still not enough because you are not, you're going to speak with an accent. You're always going to be the outsider. Everything is not enough. Everything you give is not enough. So. I'm not surprised that someone would say that, though I think my experience, I've been in Spain for six years. I've interviewed a hundred women now, much more lines up with what's happening in this book, which is no matter what socioeconomic level that you're at, you are foreign. You're an immigrant. And no matter how progressive of a society you think you're in, that otherness uh, tends to strip away your humanity in a way that even people who yeah. will swear up and down, they have so many Black friends or whatever it is, you know, they don't yeah. realize yeah. that yeah. your humanity is being stripped from you. I think. Yeah. That's exactly, exactly what really drew me to the first book and this book is that it's an accurate depiction of living abroad as a Black woman. It just is. No matter how much some of these characters get on my nerves, they do. <laughs> and how about yeah. this, Lola? I'm just going to put all my business out there. I told you that I was talking to a girlfriend of mine about this interview. And, she said, and I was like, oh, there's these characters. Yes. They're just driving me nuts. And she goes... No, I find that the characters that disturb me the most are the most accurate reflection of something yeah. I've gone through. And of course, I didn't want to hear that. Because, no, no, I, I don't want to hear that. Yeah. That can't be yeah. true. And yet it is. It, it, I think it absolutely is. In fact, it is my unwillingness to show them grace is I think a mm -hmm. reflection of my own hmm, frustration of integration and assimilation that I've gone through. Now I've had drama with men. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get all the way into it, but I've, I've gone through some things yeah, and I think yeah, yeah. my reaction yeah. is like, don't do this girl, be better. And yet, yeah. And yeah. yet these characters yeah. do allow for, one, a completely different approach to these situations, an uh, approach that is yes. softer 
and is more meandering and is probably more true to life. I think I have found with myself this frustration of not getting it right the first time. You live in a foreign country. With I live in yeah. Spain, so the bureaucracy is on a whole other level of incomprehension. Yeah. 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 But yes. your characters are accurate uh, portrayals of what it is to, even with some zest and urgency, you are meandering through a, a different country and a different language and a different culture yeah. while meandering through your own life and trying to figure out what these things even mean. And meandering through a lot of insecurities, right? All the women, they had all sorts of insecurities. I mean, if we take a look at Kemi, even though she, you know, doing all of this stuff, she still had her insecurity, right? That she's this uh, boss lady who is still second, quote unquote, society says you're still second choice. So in a sense, her ego, because I kept talking about Ragnar's wife, right? Who is what society will say is the ideal. But yet, he did this. So I also wanted to show how her ego was feeding into this as well, to her detriment, right? Or like even with Britney, where, um, you know, just the tension between Britney, because Britney is a kept woman and Kemi is not. So there's always that tension between them. And But also that she's not getting something that they don't talk too much about a lot, but it's family, which is this kind of fetish, fetishization of the black women. You know, it tends to be, I don't want to like generalize, but tends to be kind of middle-aged uh, white guys, you know, and stuff like that. And that's why I also brought that Matthias character with Yasmin, because he represents everything she despises physically. But then at the end, they become friends because she's realizing I'm treating him as an individual. He doesn't represent everybody that hurt me, right? So it's the book has so many, like, <laughs> layers that and even if it's just one line it could be one line and that line you unpack but it's all by choice because I really wanted to make it very readable very engaging and and, and uh, interesting I mean it's been crazy I really enjoyed you know? how you approached dating and fetishization in this second book because I've, dating abroad is always a very popular uh, subject. I have so many episodes on it and they do numbers. As a content creator, it's like, great. But also it's kind of like, come on. Like, because there's this underlying... Let's find yeah, something else to talk about. Yeah, there's this underlying belief, particularly for, I'll say for Black American women, that they're going to go abroad and like, it, you're going to meet this Italian or somebody is going to be everything that... I don't know, Jamal and Atlanta wasn't. And there are some women who I've had on my show who have said, you know what? When I lived in New York, all the Black men loved the foreigns. Now I'm a foreign in this country. Why should I lean into this exoticism and stuff like that? Which is a personal choice. It makes me feel very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. a personal choice. Yeah. And I really enjoy how you yeah. discuss it from Yagis and Yasmin, he is constantly on her behind. Yeah. It people are constantly talking about her behind. Yeah, like it just is. Yes, yeah. he's such an exhausting character. Like she's, she's like, why are you talking about? It's like, what have you seen your butt? Your butt? Why shouldn't I brag? Like it's very exhausting. But go on. Yes. With Kemi, you have, I would say, the dynamic between her and Tobias and her and Ragnar are different aspects of fetishization. And I would say, obviously with Ragnar, it's very blatant. Yeah. With Sabahis, I think it's more subtle because he is mixed race and he is grappling with identity uh, in a white <laughs> country. And, um, and the things that he compliments her and, and uh, affirms in her, even just character, not even just physically, are stereotypical things that she's tired. Yeah. Like, you're yeah. so strong and you're just this. And it's yeah. like, I'm crying to you. Yeah. I'm clearly not strong. Yeah. Like, what are we talking about? Yeah. And then to yeah. Brittany, who is yeah. obviously objectively beautiful. She's a model. Everybody knows that she's a model. and But she's a stand-in for a dead woman. And he has wow. auditioned many other women yes. that are similarly complected. Yes, 
built. <laughs> that's that's the creepy part. It's, you know, and like, and the fact that it's a consistent theme that you know the startup uh, founder, the uh, woman who came in for the yeah. pitch. I'm just like with this fetishization, though, there does come to my point with my previous guest a sense of leverage and power. Will you allow this fetishization to disempower you? Will you take it and run with it as much as you can and squeeze as much as you can out of it? And it is so frustrating. Yes. And it, it's another form of survival. I always say it's another form of survival. It's not the everyday in your face or vet racism survival where you feel like you're struggling. It's the, you know what? Why did you write this book? Why are you shaking the table? I'm surviving. I'm happy by my lake in the wood with this dude <laughs> eating buns every day. But it's another way of survival. It's not truly thriving because you've said, you know what? This is where I want to be in life. But I may not be able to self-actualize beyond that. I may not be able to become, I don't know, the CEO of this guy or, or do whatever I want to do to or, or open my own flower shop or self-actualize because that limit has been put on me. So it's like there's a limit on you but with comfort down there and you're never allowed to thrive or expand out of that. So in a sense, the women that say that, well, I'm foreign, why can't I leverage that? It's another form of survival. It's a power thing. And I said it in the first book, Mona wants just a little bit of power every day so she doesn't feel helpless. So for the women saying that, they want that power so they feel like they have some power in that situation. At the end of the day, it is a power struggle. I mean, it's relatable in a lot of ways. I mean, it's, I mean, women have been wielding beauty and people wield all the things that they have to attain the power. Something you wrote in um, Brittany's section, it was early on, it's page seven. I think she's, she's barricaded in her bedroom because <laughs> she's like, who is this man? Uh, what's going on? And you write, she knew deep down why she let this stranger in. She wanted to taste what it would feel like to be wrapped in a class above all others, where race no longer mattered. Yeah. So Brittany welcomed his advances. She wanted his privilege cloaked around her shoulders. And that's why you, you talk to a lot of women you know, in Europe that that, will, that line will trigger them. Because that's what they wanted. It's you. Know, that's why a lot of people move from the U.S. Is I'm tired of this. I'm what more than this. I wanna. I wanna be like the next Tina Turner in Switzerland. I'm dying tired of this. Like I just do that. I move. And these are not conversations we have um, transparently without judgment. You know. And th these are conversations I can have with lots of women while giving grace. You know because. If, even though it may not be my values or it's different, I give grace because people need to do what they need to do to survive, to have their head above water. Why did you decide to title the book, Everything is Not Enough? Because I have feelings about this title, for sure. Absolutely. And that title, so the working title of the book was called Shards, like Broken Shards. But then we felt like the title wasn't enough. It wasn't good the story of the women. And so we were the team we were doing some internal brainstorming. And then uh, the editor that bought the book said, what about everything is not enough? And I sat on it and thought about it. And I'm like, you know what? That actually works. Because no matter what you do as your Black woman, because the world is still very disproportionate in terms of the space we are given to fully be and express all our emotions, it will always feel like it's not enough. And so that was what I wanted to capture in this book, that you can keep trying and trying and shedding and code twitching and everything you want to do and integrating and trying to assimilate instead, it will still never be enough because you are then pulling away from who you truly are and that you can't sustain long-term because you are giving your life on someone else's terms. 
You know, when I first read the title and then when I started to read the book, I quickly got that and it pierced me to the core like this entire book did. I was like, oh, I'm going to see my therapist next week. And I'll be like, this book brought up a lot of things <laughs> to talk about <laughs> about my experience. Yes, it's very triggering. It's a very triggering book. This title also made me think about something you said uh, way back October 2020 when we originally recorded. And in our first recording, you dropped so many gems. And one in particular in response to the question that I give all of my guests, which is uh, how do you define wellness for yourself and how has wellness and your, your practice of wellness really been influenced by your time abroad? And your response was so profound that it became your cold open. And uh, you said then, you said, for me, wellness is like a space where you're allowed to exist without explanation and just be. And for a Black woman, there are very few spaces we can actually just be and exist as we are. And so, because you're the author, this is a fiction book, you're the author, you create all these characters, and none of these women are really allowed to be. They are not being, they are not really allowed to exist. And I'm wondering why, as the author, why did you choose, choose that for them, that tension, that constant tension? Because context matters, right? You know, I think there are some places where we may feel more comfortable than others. And especially in the Nordics, um, it's still not as, it's, it's quite diverse, but still not as diverse as other parts of the world. And so these are conversations that are not being had as transparently as possible so that we can all thrive, right? Because we're all tired of surviving. We just want to start thriving. You know, it's when you think of the Maslow hierarchy of needs at the very top is uh, self-actualization. And that is where we all want to be. And so what I wanted to show with this book was I wanted to drop everyone right into the middle of the transition points for each of these women. You don't know them. You just meet it, all three of them at major life transitions. Now, you as the reader, are you going to give them grace as they go through their life transitions? Are, are you going to process them through all the stereotypes the world has crafted on their behalf as they are going through that transition in their life? So that was what I wanted to do with this book make these characters, put them in major transition points, make them messy, and see if you, as the reader, treat them as just a fellow human muddling through life or just a stereotype. Well, you just called me out, Lola, because that's exactly what was my issue. <laughs> I don't read fiction very often. And so, um, and my whole premise of my podcast is I interview real Black women around the world, and I'm able to extend so much grace. But also, fair enough, these women are not giving me all the business. They're not giving me all their business like that, right? <laughs> and yes, this yes. book really did pull on my concept of grace. And I'm glad that you said that because I don't know if you've been seeing this around the internet on maybe IG posts or LinkedIn posts, but there has been this more conversation about Black mediocrity instead of Black excellence. Mm. And I was yes. like, well, at first I was like, why would, why would you even want to be mediocre? I don't want, I want that. But as I was learning more about it, it is more about just allowing someone to be and if they can just be, they can survive and also thrive like their white counterparts. And then I had to examine a lot of my judgment, mostly for Brittany and, and Kemi. There was, there was a part, it was particularly when, oh my goodness, when Kemi and Ragnar, when she brings him over to her house. Yeah. I, it probably yeah. took me an hour to get through that scene because I kept on putting down the book, huffing and puffing around my house. And I just thought to myself, you know, when yeah. Tobias came and she was slumped over, I said, I thought to myself, if you're going to be a mistress, if you're going to cheat, 
You need to be, yeah. you need to do it yeah. with excellence. Basically, that was my thought. <laughs> <laughs> right? My no, son, no, you no, strip the yeah. bed, you, you air out your house, you take a shower, you do all these things. And I then realized right. that I had no grace for this woman in this moment. She had, done, she had done something problematic and questionable, right? Okay, morals aside, she was clearly yeah. in distress yeah. and I had no grace for her. I realized when I put this book down, that if these characters were white, I would have been like, you're silly. Yeah. Silly white women. Yes. But the ferociousness, the visceral yeah. feeling that I had was like, if y'all gonna cheat, be the best cheater. If you're gonna marry this man and yes. he's gonna have all this money and you think you're gonna play him like a fiddle, play him like a yeah. fiddle. Be strategic. Yes. <laughs> That's the word. Be strategic in your struggle. Right? Don't yeah, be. Okay. There's no time... For weakness, which actually yeah. goes to your uh, dedication page where you say, for the strong, looking for safe spaces to be weak. So I would love for you just to reflect on that. This You have these flawed yeah. characters that are, I suppose, being mediocre while they're figuring out their life. How do you, how do you yeah. wrap with that? How, what do you think about this mediocrity and excellence? Absolutely. And I, and I do want to get back to your point of like, Kemi should have stripped the bed, kind of covered at racks. Then that would have been bothersome, right? Because that was out of character. It was something that was out of character for her to do. So for her to like try and cover at racks, so that felt like made her feel more dubious in a sense, right? That she was doing it with purpose. And with that whole relationship, what I wanted to show was the, the kind of flip side of power. Because power, and I think it was Malcolm that said it in the book, that, and it's true in society, Black women and white men are about as polar opposites as you can, and while sort of mirroring each other. So a white man with power is the person that triggers him is a black woman standing in power. The problem with power is that power is also attractive. And so that is what happened with Kemi and Ragnar is because they were power tussling. That was then what caused that, that attraction because confidence is actually quite attractive. But uh, going to the point of making these women as uh, <laughs> mediocre and messy as possible, is to show that the deepest well can also be drained. And that's one of my favorite Swedish phrases. In Swedish, it's then du pastet brunnen kan också Thomas. So the deepest well can also be drained. And black women are some of the deepest wells in society. So what I wanted to show with their stories is once they start losing strengths and that, <laughs> um, bottomless quote-unquote source of resilience then at the bottom of it all they are just human beings like you and me that need support emotionally mentally physically holistically and so that was what I wanted to do and so there were so many triggering things in the book to force the readers to deal with their own bias or conscious or subconscious bias the, the last question I'll ask then, because I could, as you can see, talk to you about this book for hours and hours. Um, the yeah. last thing I will ask you is kind of a general reflection. You know, Flourish in the Foreign is about showcasing Black women's voices and stories who live abroad and are thriving abroad. By the end of the book, it could be said that they are thriving abroad. And I'm wondering... How do you define that thriving for each of the character and how did you come to those conclusions? I think thriving is obviously it's very individual. It's when you feel like you feel safe and you feel like, you know what, I can now just breathe and I'm starting to make spaces and create communities where, you know, like I said, I can just exist. Um, then you're on the path to thriving. It doesn't matter whether you have, you have a lot of money. Yasmin doesn't have a lot of money, but she still like she's thriving. She feels like, you know what? I love, this is what I love to do. I'm now getting known for what I love to do. That's, she's on a path to creating whatever that future is for her. Brittany has come back 
she's you know she's thriving in that she's still kept but with freedom when she was there she was kept but without freedom now she has all the freedom she wants as well as all these resources <laughs> so it's for her it was like a win-win right and then for Kenny she has what she wanted in the sense that she actually really did want a family right but now I don't know if he's thriving on represent. I think Kemi is always going to Kemi, you know, based on that uh, last uh, message she got at the end. But um, I think they are all, they've all grabbed their own agency and now making and moving through life on their own terms the way they want to do. And I think that's a start. Thank you so much, Lola, for your time. I really enjoyed chatting with you. For everyone, everything is not enough is available now. Run! And get this book so we can all have a book club and chat Thank about you. it. Thank you so much, Lola. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. Big thanks to Lola. Lola, you know, it's just always a pleasure to chat with you. I admire you. And you are always so very generous with your time and your encouragement. And I really, really appreciate you. Also, shout out to Ayo and the entire head of Sue's publishing and publicity team. I appreciate y'all so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Flourish in the Foreign. If you'd like to learn more about this guest, please check out their show notes page at flourishintheforeign.com slash episodes. If you would like to be a guest or know of someone who would be an interesting guest on the podcast, please fill out the guest inquiry form located on the website under the contact tab. That's flourishintheforeign.com slash contact. I will be doing another Ask Me Anything episode at the end of the season, so be sure to please submit your questions via the link in the description of this episode. Stay up to date with everything that is happening with me and the podcast by subscribing to the Flourish in the Foreign newsletter. You can subscribe to the newsletter via the link in the description of this episode or by going to the website flourishintheforeign.com. Be sure to check out the Flourish in the Foreign blog and the Flourish in the Foreign bookshop powered by bookshop.org, where you can support local bookstores and Flourish in the Foreign at the same time. Check out my list of books to help you move, live, and thrive abroad. Make sure that you are subscribed to the Flourish in the Foreign YouTube channel for when I drop new videos and follow the podcast on Instagram and TikTok at Flourish Foreign. You can also follow the podcast on LinkedIn at Flourish in the Foreign. And of course, subscribe to the podcast via whichever platform you listen on and leave a review. As always, Big thanks to Zachary Higgs for producing the music of this here podcast. Remember, it's not about moving abroad. It's not about being abroad. It's about flourishing abroad. So go abroad and cultivate a life well lived. See you next time. On the next episode of Flourish in the Foreign. And I will never forget, he said, do you like it? And I was like, I do like it here. Like, I'm going to have a business here. I'm looking up at him. And he's like, no, how are you going to do that? You're an African-American woman, okay? And you're in a Muslim country. I don't know how you think you're going to do that. And that's also, you're challenging me. Oh, even more reason for me to do it. And from that, I ended up going knocking on doors. And I just said, I'm going to have a business. I didn't know what that business was going to be. I had no clue what I was doing. Couldn't speak Arabic. Didn't know hardly anything about the culture. I just knew I wanted to do it. <laughs>